The title of today's webinar is Entrepreneurism, uh, Do You Have What It Takes? And um, apparently it is very difficult to pronounce the, the name uh, or the title, ent Entrepreneurism. Uh, but I would say that it, it is even more difficult to, to practice it. And I'm, hope, and I'm hoping and I'm happy that we will have a chance to learn from some of the best um, in this uh, area, uh, John Bitov uh, Jr. and Chris uh, Pavlovsky. Uh, Marta, I would like to thank you as well for accepting uh, to moderate uh, this session, especially knowing that you're busy and it is quite busy in Serbia, where you are currently, uh, with uh, elections coming up uh, this weekend. Uh, to introduce Marta, she's an advisor to the Prime Minister of Serbia for e-government, digitalization and innovation, and also former Minister for Information Society and Public Administration in Macedonia. She's an expert for the UN for several activities, mainly related to ICT and telecommunications, as well as business advisor to several digital companies in Europe and Middle East. Uh, while in the private sector or in the past, uh, Marta was part of the C-level executive in the ICT industry, including CEO of the first internet provider uh, in Macedonia. Uh, otherwise, or privately, Marta loves traveling uh, and she loves also nature. Marta is also a member of uh, our Kellogg Alumni uh, Club uh, and uh, program. Uh, before I give the floor to Marta, I would just like to mention a few housekeeping uh, rules. I would like uh, to ask everyone to stay muted uh, during the discussion and the call. Uh, please also write your questions, comments, and so on in the chat. We will try to make sure that we answer or address everyone's comments and, and questions. In terms of the timing, uh, what we initially plan is to have 30 minutes of interview in which Marta will interview John and uh, Chris and plus 45 minutes for Q&A uh, session. I think that based on your interest, we can partly or a uh, little bit extend this, uh, but really trying to, to have a dynamic and um, hopefully very helpful um, webinar uh, today. So Marta, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nikita. Um, I am impressed with the audience here and I think that we are going to have a very productive uh, discussion on the topic which is uh, exciting uh, as the entrepreneurship is. Uh, uh, I will start by introducing John and Chris. Uh, we'll start with John. Uh, his CV is way too long and I will try to present it as briefly as I can. Um, in one sentence, uh, John Presbytov has a distinguished record of accomplishment in the corporate sport and the community endeavors. He is the sole shareholder holder of Obelisk, which has major investments in the wireless, satellite, radio, real estate, and other businesses. He is also a co-founder and chair of Selva Ventures, which is a U.S.-based venture capital firm co-founder and managing principal of Point North, capital founder of um, Mobilicity, founder, chairman and controlling shareholder of HM Canada that later merged with Sirius to become Sirius HM Canada, namely Canada fastest growing media subscription uh, business with over 3 million subscribers and several other business ventures um, worth millions. But what I also want to mention is uh, what makes him very popular and distinguish him from the other successful businessmen is that he founded the Toronto Raptors Basketball Club in, back in 1993. Um, he volunteered as a president and chief executive officer of Toronto's bid for the 2008 Olympic Games, unfortunately awarded to Beijing, China. Uh, he headed the organization committees that brought the successful World, World Indoor Athletics Championship and World Championships of Basketball to Canada in 1993 and 1994, respectively. He is a co-founder uh, and uh, board member, which I guess you already know of um, Macedonia 2025. When he is, where he is the chief sponsor of the Bit of Family Entrepreneurship Program um, in partnership with CESO. So he is um, a man uh, with a big heart, not just a businessman. So I will, I will continue to, to introduce uh, um, um, the other panelists today, uh, Chris Pavlovsky 
which on the other hand has another advantage, he is a representative of the younger generation of globally renowned entrepreneurs of Macedonian origin and has been a finalist for the Ernst & Young Entrepreneurs of the Year uh, for under 30s. He is a serial and global entrepreneur and one of uh, the businesses Chris founded is a global IT business with offices in Europe and North America. Namely, Chris uh, is the CEO and founder of Rumble.com uh, and in case some of you don't know, which I doubt, Rumble is a video platform that has distribution partnerships with established media companies such as Microsoft, Yahoo, Bell and many more. Uh, Chris never imagined Rumble being one of the top 100 companies in the USA and top 10 in Canada. Uh, because Rumble grew faster than Facebook, Foursquare, JW Player, and many more. And um, Chris once said, this is what happens when you have the best team that's across, across four continents, uh, Canada, USA, Macedonia, countries, uh, oh, excuse me, Canada, USA, Macedonia, and Serbia, uh, which means that he has also a company in Macedonia and Serbia, uh, named Cosmic Development, uh, ranked as the second best employer in Macedonia and recipient, a recipient of numerous awards. Chris, similar to John, is also a philanthropist and sits on numerous boards. He serves on the board of Everyday Child, a non-profit charity organization, on the advisory board of CloseCon, a uh, social network for close friends and family, and of course, uh, we have him here as an esteemed board member of Macedonia 2025. So um, if you have to add something to this, both of you, please, please do so. Chris, John? No, or... you got it. You got enough with, the, <laughs> enough with the introductions. I think people want to get okay. into the uh, topics. Okay, let's go to the topics. So topics, um, entrepreneurship. Uh, just a brief, brief, brief exercise. Can you both describe uh, entrepreneurship in three words? And I would ask the audience to do the same in the chat uh, if possible, and I will tell you later uh, why, why I need this exercise, please. Uh, commitment, confidence, communication, three Cs. Oh. Okay, commitment, confidence, and communication. Okay, what about you, Chris? Unmute. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, risk, uh, reward, and responsibility. <laughs> uh, risk, reward, and what? Responsibility. Oh, so we have three R. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay now, so, um, while we are talking about risk, there is a question that I would uh, like to pose to, to John. John, you have been crossing the wall of debt, uh, which is the hardest part of the entrepreneurship cycle, many times. So what is the most important thing when you, let's say, move from, from early stage of a startup to scale up to, to making revenues? And as an investor, at what stages are the companies you invest the most uh, with your VC funds? So what is the toughest part in the, in the uh, entrepreneurial journey? Well, the, the, the startup's always, always the hardest because things just go crazy from day to day. Um, that's why at the end of the day, you have to build a good team. And that's the hardest part that people who have dreams and aspirations is they don't realize how important it is to build management teams and uh, respect and communication amongst those management teams because it's, uh, it's, it's very hard, if not impossible, to do it all on your own. And uh, I've, I've always found even in my own, you know, in, now that I'm more of an investor, um, I'm always looking at the management teams and the business plan. Finding capital is easy. Um, putting together a good management team and a good strategic plan of what you're going to do with the business is the hardest part. Uh, executing on that, you've got the right team with the right strategy, um, you know, it can be done. So, so uh, what are the stages of the companies you invest the most? Well, it's, it, it depends. I do everything from startups, uh, 
Pure Venture, although again with Pure Venture, I did it. I set, established a fund, uh, hired a management team to run the fund because I'm, I'm, you know, I don't have the skill set uh, to assess, um, you know, with this energy bar has the right manufacturing process or the right distribution process to uh, scale up the business. Um, I'll buy mature businesses that are, uh, you know, cash generating, and then I'll do high growth businesses where you're beyond startup, but they need additional capital to take the business to the next level. So, but in each case, it's never by myself. I work with partners or groups or management teams um, that assist in, uh, in, in the task. And, and, and um, Chris, um, John said that finding capital is easy. What, what was for you? Uh, was it easy for you to find investors? Uh, because you started your business very young and um, uh, how, how did you, you know, how did you cope with the finding investors at that early age? Was your idea, idea so good they, that you attracted them immediately? Was it easy for you? Well, I guess the best thing to do is to kind of start off and how I actually started. I don't think I've told this story too many times, but uh, it was back in high school, uh, I think uh, grade 11, and uh, I think it was the 90s, late 90s. And everybody, was, everybody just got their email addresses. That's kind of what we had. And everybody was passing around funny things in their emails, like they were passing on like jokes. So I came up with this idea where we can set up a website that just uh, curates all this content and has people pass around viral funny things. And I begged my mom and dad for about three years for $10 to use on their credit card to get a domain name and start a website. So it didn't, the, the biggest investment was from my parents and it was about $10 at the time. Um, the rest of the investment was me and my friend in our basements coding and developing a website um, to, to start the business. So in terms of uh, raising capital at that time, it was, uh, it wasn't, going to VCs or going to private equity to try to find capital to start the business. It started from there. And uh, it was, you know, it was right at the, right at the tail end of the dot com boom. I was in grade 11 and we opened up the website. And in the first month, uh, you know, the way we made money was for every email address that we collected, we would sell that data to another company. And it was something like, it was a crazy high rate because it was the dot com boom. And I remember making $5,000 in the first month and $10,000 in the second month. And uh, that was, uh, you know, enough capital to kind of get myself going. But being in grade 11 and seeing $15,000 come, come to you from the first business that you start within two minutes, I mean, uh, within two months was a lot of money. And I thought I had enough money for university going forward from there. So I uh, kind of shut everything down, use that money um, to go to the bars and have fun rather than continue the business during the dot-com boom, which was a horrible mistake, let me tell you. But uh, that's how it started. And the investment was, uh, you know, only $10 at the time. Fast forward like 10 years later, um, you know, for Rumble, I actually tried to go get investment and uh, didn't really get it. I, I failed at that. I think there's multiple reasons for that. Um, I So I ended up bootstrapping up Rumble. I bootstrapped basically every business that I've ever started on my own with my own money and figuring out how to do that with uh, the resources of my friends and myself and uh, starting things up without any capital. So everything I've ever done from Rumble to Cosmic has been done out of my own wallet, um, starting from that $10 that my mom gave me back in the 90s. Okay, but, but Chris, in fairness, you have had chances to bring in capital and you didn't accept it a few times. And it's uh, not... I, I, I think I think the the issue is you 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 know maybe at the beginning when you didn't have the track record and you didn't have the management team it might have been a little harder like it is for all of us but then you get to the phase where sometimes where you run into good business and people are putting term sheets in front of you for financing and you're turning them down. I've never turned down a term sheet. I've never received one <laughs> ever in my life. Okay, somebody is not telling the truth here. No, I'm joking. So, but uh, for both of you, what what was the the main driver? You know, to become entrepreneur, was it was it success? Was it money? Uh, was it 
Never, it's never, it's never, it's never money. Okay. It's, it's, it's in my case, it's always about um, particularly doing something that either other people don't see value or don't see the opportunity. And you say, I can do that. We can do that. Um, it's, it's, you know, we, I, we never start a business up to sell it or buy a business to sell it. When people want to buy your business, they'll come to you. The thing you have to be focused on is building a scalable, good business. And, and Chris, what, what was for you the main drive driver when you started uh, at that age? What, like, uh, you know, there is a difference, obviously, what is the main driver to, to enter into an uh, entrepreneurship journey? Uh, and uh, when you started in high school and when you are already uh, experienced and you know, uh, what does it mean? Yeah, so in grade 11, it was, uh, it was all about proving my parents that I can go and do things on my own, <laughs> get my own place and have my own car, having kind of independence. So it was all about proving to, to my parents I can do it. For like two, three years, they thought I was a drug dealer. Like they were like, how do you make money? Like, how is this possible? Um, typical, I guess, Macedonian parents just can't, they didn't understand like how you could make five thousand dollars in a month and you're in grade eleven, other than doing something really bad. So, um, for me, it was a lot about proving to my parents that I was capable of doing it, and uh, that was it was all that was my main driver in the very early stages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you you now have businesses in Macedonia, Serbia, as I said, U.S. Uh, and and Canada. Could you tell us the differences? Um, what what do we have in this region that um, that in US in and Canada you don't and vice versa? Oh, <laughs> that's a tough one because like the way I kind of see it is like every country everywhere in the world has like similar things and they all have the the resources are all similar. Um, you know, there's great developers in Canada. There's great developers in Macedonia. There's great management teams everywhere. Um, so I don't really kind of bucket the differences that much between country to country. Mm -hmm. um, the, the main driver why I even went to Macedonia in the first place is obviously because I'm Macedonian. There's a lot better markets, uh, bigger markets, I should say, to go to if you want to do an outsourcing company. You can go to India, you can go to Brazil or South America. There's just a lot of different pools of markets that you can go to that are probably going to fit that situation better. Macedonia was entirely just uh, doing something that I felt that, you know, I needed to do as a Macedonian. I was getting called on the fact that I wasn't doing anything to help. So I, uh, I did that out of just pure being Macedonian. And then uh, going to Serbia was more of a business uh, opportunity because uh, we had a partner out there that wanted, to, wanted us to bring it out there. And uh, we, we teamed up with them and he helped us uh, start up something in Serbia. And that's a lot, much larger talent pool than it is in Macedonia. But uh, in terms of the actual differences between every country, obviously culturally is, uh, are, are the main differences, but in terms of like capabilities, they're all relatively the same. Um, you get what you pay for at the, at the, end, of the, at the end of the day. And uh, you can access really good people in any country that you go to. But I wouldn't say anything else, other than the cultural differences there are the, and a few of the uh, differences also on the, the way work is set up and uh, political environments. But other than that, it's, uh, it's the same thing from country to country as long as you get the right people. Um, John, you, you have, your businesses are, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in, in US and in Canada. Uh, and um, I, do, I, I just wonder if you have been thinking to, to start something uh, some business uh, in this region, uh, a part of, of what you are doing and investing with Macedonia 2025, or basically you are, your focus is to, you know, provide, uh, to, pro to provide a pool of, through your executive um, education programs, to provide a pool of people that, that, that can uh, run their own businesses in, in Macedonia. Johnny, on mute. Uh, you asked me three questions there that I'll, uh, I'll try and segment each one. Yeah. On the first, um, I'd love to find businesses to invest in Macedonia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
I haven't yet. Some of the things I've, you know, when you, when you get into real estate or lending, things I do in Canada, the laws are very much different over there in terms of uh, what you can and can't do. And rather than spend my time to understand the differences in jurisdictions, I've just, you know, kind of passed up on that stuff. I think there are certain sectors that, that could be high growth that would love to be part of, uh, uh, you know, to assist in, uh, in capital uh, deployment uh, for those businesses. A few years ago, recognizing that, you know, hadn't found anything to invest in, um, Mike Zafirovsky came to me with uh, that CF program, which is, you know, sort of a early stage uh, financing um, in, in, in the region, um, put some money into that. And quite frankly, it hasn't done well. Um, for all kinds of reasons, uh, uh, you know, the, the situation with, um, you know, pre prespa created investor uncertainty, post prespa you get into COVID. Um, so I don't think I'd put money in a fund again, because I think that uh, when, when there's a fund manager deployed to put capital to work, they just try and find deals as opposed to um, specific deals. The, bit of education program, um, entrepreneur program that we're doing is really just my brothers, my sister and I finding a way to give back and to help strengthen the country. Um, we've, we've fostered a lot of businesses here in Canada, work with a lot of entrepreneurs. I actually believe small and medium sized businesses are way more important to the growth of a country and strengthening democracy than multinationals are. And, and it's our way of, of trying to create a mentor program with the Keats and the Macedonia 2025 team to, to help uh, entrepreneurs and small enterprises um, get going and take their business to the next level. But that, that is strictly philanthropy, what we're doing on that end. There's no expectation that there's going to be any kind of direct economic benefit to, to us by doing it. Uh, but no matter where you are, if you are giving advice uh, to someone that is, uh, that is about to launch their own business, what would you tell them it's most important uh, before they launch? They have, to, they, have to, they have to take their business plan and give it to people they, they respect and have them critique it and then listen. The biggest problem most entrepreneurs have is they don't listen to the feedback because it's like, well, I have this vision and I want to do it. And, you know, one of the things I admire about Chris is I've seen him change his main business focus, either company wise or within that company, as the markets have told him he has to change. And that's what a good, good entrepreneur does. They listen to their customers and their clients and they figure out how am I going to solve their problems as opposed to telling my customers and clients why they need me. Chris, what about you? What, what, would, you, what would be your advice? Um, I think it goes back to what John said earlier. It, your team, the management team, is something that, uh, that matters the most in terms of uh, starting up a business. Having the right people around you is so important and you don't really you know in my position I, I didn't really learn that till later on as I had bigger businesses but in the early going it was mostly just like you know a couple guy operation making money from our basements in the early days and then as you start having larger businesses and making more money and then you get your office space and then you start expanding and you have like 20 30 people then things start to matter that you never really kind of had your eyes open to before and that really surrounds like having a really good team and having a really intelligent and really loyal team that's uh that's going to be there with you through thick or thin as much as possible so i would say like if you're looking to build a big business and a strong business the the, the first thing that you need to really focus on is is that management team having people around you that are going to be there for you no matter what and that are extremely intelligent can help you get to the places you need to go but all you i guess you also have some mentors so like i guess you have um, you have uh, john or or mike as your mentors i i just guess i'm just curious 
uh, because I really need, I really think that for the young entrepreneur, that it's a, it's a must to have somebody who has been more experienced to guide you, to guide you through the process and who you can reach, you know, for a simple advice, uh, whether to, you know, to, to take some of the actions uh, on daily basis, for example, or not. Is it relevant to you? Does it uh, resonate with you or not? Yeah, 1000%. A mentor, like for John, is a perfect example. You know, I've looked up to John since uh, I've been a child, hearing stories about his family and, you know, him starting the Raptors and everything. So, one of the things that uh, John was instrumental with in, in Rumble is that you brought in a really good person to sit on our management team, exactly guiding me in that direction to, to bring someone. The first thing he, I remember when I was telling him about Rumble. Uh, near the early days is like you need a finance guy like you need a really good finance guy and he was uh, instrumental in helping me find that person so having someone guide you and kind of show you things that you don't really see being an entrepreneur you don't really think of the importance of having a finance guy on your team and tell someone that's you know smarter and that's been there and has done it to tell you to do it that you you go and, and do it so yeah having a mentor is uh having multiple mentors is like the best thing you, you can do because like they I, I totally agree with Chris you need multiple mentors um, you know some might be stronger in sales or financing or government relations or whatever but you know to think when you're 28 years old that you have all the answers mm -hmm. is a huge mistake I was very blessed and one of the things I wanted to do before they all started dying was have a dinner with all my mentors at a fancy restaurant and thank them all for helping me because, um, you know, they never charged me anything. They never asked for anything. They were just happy to take a phone call or take a meeting or have me buy them lunch and ask them questions about growing the business. And uh, um, I often found you'd, you'd leave that meeting or you'd leave that lunch feeling that much more confident about what it is you're doing because um, they either reinforce something or they pointed out some, some uh, mistakes you were making or errors in your business that, that you needed to get addressed. And, uh, and, and it's important to start with your mentors early because over time you build a trust with them and, the, and, and, and they build a trust with you where you kind of know where to go to, for them. Um, on the issues but more importantly uh, when they tell you 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 take their word for it because it's not someone you just called up to go meet and ask a bunch of questions for you built a relationship with them and for you john from this perspective um can you can you can you tell us what has been the greatest achievement so far in your entrepreneurship entrepreneurial career i'm just getting started marta Okay, but I said so far. That's why I said so far. Look, it's, uh, you know, financially, I don't know how to measure it, financially or management team or, or media-wise or whatever. I mean, obviously, the Raptors was, was a big part of it. Uh, uh, satellite radio, I know to a lot of Europeans, they don't know, but in North America, I mean, 85% of new vehicles have satellite radio installed, and of that, about a third of the people pay a subscription and I go back to 15 years ago, would, would, would people pay to get radio in their car? And I believe they would, and a lot of people thought it was a crazy idea. So um, I've, had, I've had lots of business successes, but what's most important to me is my family and the strength and foundation for my family, because to me, business is fun. Um, it, 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 I was having a, dinner, a conversation with my daughter last night, just on this point. Uh, She's working with me in, uh, in the new uh, startup we're doing in the restaurant business. And one of the things I say to her is we're never going to discuss business on weekends. Weekends are family time where it's about, it's about uh, keeping our relationship strong. And, um, uh, you know, but, but it, Monday to Friday, business is business and we have to talk about everything and anything. So I think having a, a good, solid foundation at home is really important to a good entrepreneur. I really believe that because you go through so many ups and downs. Um, in the business world, you need to be able to come home and relax and uh, enjoy being um, with your family. Uh, and, and because we have a um, few more minutes uh, for this interview and then we're going to uh, ask the audience for the questions, I have to ask you uh, some questions that are related to the situation that we are living now. 
uh, these pandemics. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, um, I mean, this year hasn't been an uh, easy year, but it is year for growth for, for many people and for many obvious reasons. Uh, so, because we are all uh, forced to get out of our comfort zones. So, uh, three questions here. Um, if, you, if you had one word to sum up 2020 so far, what would it be? And the same question is for the audience. If you, please, if you can please uh, write uh, your answers in the chat. So, one word to, to sum up 2020 so far. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> Mine? I, I don't know, unexpected. Would be, would be, if it's one word, not a sentence, it'd be change. I think change. things are fundamentally going to change. Okay. How, we live, how all of us live the rest of our lives, whether you're 13 years old or 65 years old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and what about you, Chris? Uh, between unexpected to crazy, <laughs> um, but I agree with John. There will definitely be some change. Okay, okay. Um, I will let you. I will tell you why I was asking this. Okay, so the second question related to to the crisis is: um, Has anything changed uh, uh, in in the way of doing business uh, as a result of the crisis? Uh, I've seen some of the uh, some of the reports of McKinsey, and they said that there has been obvious acceleration in decision making. Making is it is it true for you? Sorry, repeat the question, Myrna. Uh, has it changed? Has the crisis changed uh, the way of doing business? Uh, you know, the way of yeah, I, 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 uh, bringing decisions, for example, acceleration, some or something. Well. I look at it more in terms of from a productivity level. Uh, I, I, you know, in, in my end companies, some had to shut down, some stayed working through it, some were doing better than expected, some of their mix of sales have changed from pre-COVID to post-COVID. Um, the most important thing is just the personal lifestyle of how we work. I think there's going to be a lot more of calls like this. Um, the, the, the thought of, of traveling, flying two hours to pitch, you know, to have a meeting and flying home, I think is almost verboten going forward. People just aren't going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, we're looking at with the, our various companies, our office leases. Do we need the same amount of space that we had before? Do we even need an office in some of the companies? Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I, I just think these are, all, these are all fundamental questions about businesses going forward mm -hmm. that I think uh, are going to be continually asked. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm going to give you one example, which is really crazy what happened with us in the government here, you know, um, the government, uh, because I work in a, in a e-government, in a digital government business, so my, uh, we have always had to think through scenarios like what happened in the, if the website goes down, you know, and now we, we, we have a total, you know, uh, let's say shift in the paradigm and we, we are asking ourselves what happens now in physical offices and schools goes down. So it's totally, you know, it's completely shift of the, of the paradigm. So what about Chris, what about for you? Have you seen any change in the way of regular doing business uh, besides of teleworking and all of this stuff, but in a way that you bring decisions, for example, or um, not particularly. We haven't see, see, I think we went through like quite a crisis in 2018 with our business. So it kind of changed the way we, we operate quite a bit and, uh, made our business pretty strong in, in a lot of ways. So going into 2020, we were kind of prepared for any type of situation. I don't think we could have seen a more catastrophic situation in our business in 18. So going into 2020 and seeing ad rates drop, you know, 40, 50% overnight because of COVID, um, we were ready for it. We had multiple lines of businesses, multiple revenue streams. We were in a really strong position and we haven't really, we've been affected like everybody, but it's just, it, it's not a situation that we're all worried about. In terms of making decisions, um, I would say things like, are generally not as 
like I, I ran into an interesting discovery. We all, like a few of our management guys came into the office uh, about a week ago, two weeks ago, and we had a real big problem with one of our, with, with something that we were doing on one of our revenue streams that we couldn't figure out for three months. And then we were all in the office like a week ago, two weeks ago, and it was solved within like 10 minutes. No video chat could have solved it. It was the only way to solve it was for me to have seen something on somebody else's screen in a way that I would never have looked at it myself. And uh, that was that was striking to me because I was really kind of advocating the whole work from home. And then all of a sudden, this little bit of collaboration that I saw was able to solve a problem that we couldn't solve for three months while we're at home. So, I mean, the, the thing, Chris, we always discuss with my management guys is um, the whole hiring process. You know, that it, 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 nobody's been really hiring through this, but at a certain point, people have to get on with managing their businesses. You know, can you really hire someone remotely without sitting across the table face to face from them and then not really see them for two years because you're only existing via video with them? So we haven't gone through that uh, part of running a business because I'm sure like you, the body language in an interview is is vital in terms of you know whether I want to hire that person or not. And the other thing is just even buying businesses. You know you can't kick the tires remotely if there's a factory or a plant or uh, you know or a distribution center something that that you need to uh, or even an office that you you know you're acquiring. So we haven't gone through some of these things, which I think in the coming months are going to be really telling in terms of how people how people operate. Because I'm not sure I want to hire someone and not see them for five years other than by video. Yeah, exactly. And here's a really interesting micro data point. Um, Cosmic, for example, and this, I was talking to, to my partner about it a couple of weeks ago and it just shocked me. I was like, so how are you handling COVID? And he's like, we have like a 20, 30% increase in requests to hire, which was mind blowing for me. I was like, what? Um, so now that everybody's kind of moved to this work from home, People don't necessarily need to hire like right out of their city if they're not going to see these people anymore. So outsourcing has become like in high demand all of a sudden, um, which is, in, it goes to your point, like we like to sit in front of people, see see their body language and when we're making hiring decisions. Um, but if we're not doing that going forward, how does that, what does that mean for the current talent pool in Toronto? Are people going to look everywhere now? Is, is the talent pool the whole world all of a sudden? So there's uh, interesting changes there. Um, and that's just a micro data point, but I found that to be quite interesting. I, I did not expect companies to be hiring during this phase. Uh, you know, we've put a pause onto it, but apparently there are. And there's been a pretty dramatic increase in the little company that I have. So that's, that, I found that to be quite interesting. So, you know, Marta, I'm just looking at all the questions that you're getting here. Is someone monitoring those and going to address them? Yeah, because yeah. This we are going, going to start right away. We are going to start right away. I, before I do this, I just want to ask you one more question. Uh, has the crisis inspired you to establish a new venture, a new product or service? Have you started some new venture now? I I'm mean, opening up a restaurant chain here in, in Canada. I, I, uh, heard, I heard. Congrats. Congratulations. You know, I, I, I'm a firm believer that, uh, that um, uh, every problem creates a set of opportunities. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, uh, you know, it's kind of funny when my family, uh, my father, my brothers and I used to have uh, the airport uh, business here in Toronto, the restaurants and the airport, everything. And back in the in the 80s, if you had a, if, if your flight was delayed, all the airlines gave you a vouchers to go buy you know, five or ten dollars to go buy food in the restaurant. So my brothers and I, we would wake up in the morning and if there was a snowstorm and the airport had to close, we'd be high fiving and celebrating because it meant everybody had got coupons to eat in our restaurants. Whereas the entire rest of the city, if the airport closed down, was depressed. So, it, you know, every 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 everything has a silver lining. You just have to find it. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, Okay, so before we go to the questions, I just want to tell you why do I ask uh, uh, the, the question, the questions to, to, to define entrepreneurship in uh, one or three words and to define uh, 2020 so far in one word, because they are almost the same, they match. Uh, 
all the answers that you provided. It's like opportunities, uh, uh, clarity, uh, lesson, a new vision, uh, set of, of opportunities basically are, are very similar. So this year is a, is a year that is full of opportunities and let me, let me uh, finish my direct interview to you uh, by this, let's say, uh, conclusion. And now I will ask uh, Nikita to, uh, to take over with the questions of you, or you want me to do that as well from the, uh, with the questions from the audience. I'm fine, Marta, and we can, I think, coordinate if I miss something. And um, okay. probably I have a lot of questions both to Chris and John, but I will give priority <laughs> to, to the audience. Okay. Um, so, and there are two questions uh, which go to how do you essentially find uh, good mentors? Because you mentioned uh, mentorship and also how do you find uh, good or talented uh, people for, for the company? Uh, I would just uh, like to mention uh, two things. Uh, John mentioned uh, the program that we started last year, which is called Upscale. And the idea of this program is that we use the capacity and knowledge of the diaspora members, but predominantly the board members. Uh, to mentor uh, startups from Macedonia. We successfully started the program, did the matching uh, between mentors and mentees, but the COVID situation uh, negatively impacted, say, the program. We, we hope we will get back to, to the right track uh, soon. And also, I would like to, to mention that as an organization, uh, we are starting an online platform where companies that need either mentoring, access to foreign markets, investors, and so on can register. And on the other hand, we'll have diaspora members, professionals who are ready to support Macedonian companies who will also register there. So the platform will do great matching. And I hope that uh, companies from Macedonia can find great mentors through that platform. But essentially, going back to the question, uh, it is how do you find uh, uh, good mentors and good talented uh, staff? I'll take that. Uh, so that's probably... That's a good question because it's a, it's actually very difficult to find good mentors. And when you come across one, you you need to absolutely take it in as much as you possibly can. So, like for example, meeting John was was not was not easy. Um, I just happened to meet him at an awards show, and then building a relationship uh, after that is not easy as well. So it's it's really kind of by happen chance that things happen, and then you meet people that might take interest in what you're doing and then you just have to ask them for for help and uh, let them know and see if they're they're gonna if they, if they end up helping you. like you kind of for me it was a lot of luck like finding john and then john just helping me randomly is like that's kind of lucky like there you just i was in the right place at the right time it wasn't a specific way that i, that I found a mentor um or it was all just by putting myself the, the in in, in situations and uh, hopefully something coming out of that. And it's not, and I wasn't particularly looking for that. It just happened to happen. Okay, but Chris, just give a little, you, you said it was hard. Just give a little more background, not the particulars, but like why in terms of you can't just like call me up and walk in and see me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that's exactly it. So like, it's hard because if you, you know, my network at the time, I didn't really know any successful people or people that have walked past uh, um, that were in the same kind of area that I was looking to go. It was my network of people, you know, I, I lived in a town outside of Toronto, very blue collar. Um, and it was just that it, it, I didn't have really that many people to look up to. The people that I looked up to were people that I hear about and read about, like John. And uh, it, I just didn't have access to that network. So you kind of had to hustle really hard on your own, in my case, to get to a place where you could meet people and have, and have that opportunity. So it, the reason why would be just simply because I didn't have any network. I didn't, I didn't have John's phone number. And you can't just call up John to, like you said, you just can't do that. You kind of, it, it just happened by chance in my case that I, that I met John at an award show for, uh, for an Entrepreneur of the Year event. Um, I'll expand on that because I get lots of requests for meetings um, and there's only so much time in the day and you have businesses to run and you you can't do everything and, and I remember Chris came up to me and he said 
hey, I'm Macedonian. So number one, he found something to resonate with me that mattered to be different. He said, two, I'm a young entrepreneur and I got a bunch of ideas and have this business and I've even got operations in uh, Macedonia. Um, can we have a coffee and, uh, and talk? So he found, he was persistent. He found an opportunity to get me at the right time. He found things to um, resonate with me where I'd, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd welcome the opportunity to do it. But I'll say the most important thing I like about Chris because, and I'd say two thirds of the people who come to see me with their ideas and, and uh, you know, on their dreams and hopes, everything else, Chris is a great listener. We don't agree on everything. We argue quite a bit. But the things that I really push, like I told him, you need a finance guy in this business. You can't keep running around with the numbers in your head. You need someone who can be financed with a bit of a strategic sense so he can help, you know, kind of continue to draw the box about where the business is growing and explain it to others. It's just one example of several things that um, Chris listened to me. And I think most often I find people are like, if I'm not telling them what they want to hear, they, they just leave and they're like, okay, well, you know, that was great meeting him, but he's crazy or he doesn't know what he's talking about or whatever else. And, and I, I just find that that's the biggest issue younger people have, including myself at the time. You have to listen. It doesn't mean the mentoring is all right or the advice is all right or anything else, but there's usually things that they're saying. For instance, if they're peppering you on part of your sales strategy, it doesn't mean your sales strategy is wrong. It means there's something you've explained to them that, that it's not connecting the dots where they're trying to help you solve what that problem is. Well said. Back you're you muted, Brigitte. You're muted. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we, we have a question from Angela. Angela Buszewska is uh, part of our Young Talents program. So thank you, Angela, Angela, for being here and for your interest. And I hope you will have a lot of success during your lifetime. Uh, so her question is essentially uh, whether you had some uh, failure within your entrepreneurship uh, journey and to share that failure, probably it can motivate some of the young startups in the country. I've had lots of failures. <laughs> Uh, I've lost tens of millions of dollars in some businesses, um, either usually because our plan was, our assumptions were wrong on our business at the beginning, or we had missed the market, um, or we didn't have as good a management team, uh, or we weren't as well capitalized as we thought we were, but I've, I say this all the time uh, to to people, and you know, when I'm giving speeches or discussions, anything about business, you learn so much more when you fail than when you're successful. And uh, that's one of the things I love about failure is you 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 really institutionalize some of the things you did wrong to make sure you never make that mistake again. Yeah, um, I would say this this same thing. Instead of looking at it from starting up a business. Um, I feel like everything, a lot of things that I've attempted have uh, done somewhat okay, but uh, failure is uh, something that we've all experienced. And um, in 2018, I'm gonna go back to that. That was probably one of the biggest failures that I've ever seen, um, being at such a high point at one point and then crashing harder than you ever had in your life. The, the amount of things that I learned during that, that time where we failed is, is you, you can't buy that. You can't, you can't think of it. You can't experience it unless you go through it and you can't learn from it the way, the way we did. And one of the things like, you know, I learned from that situation and, and that failure is like people that stick around when times are tough and help you get through those times that are tough. Um, those are the people that you want around forever. Like those are the people that matter the most. Um, the people that run away when times are tough it's almost like a blessing that they run away. But the people that stick around, um, it's, it's, it's something like you'll give their shirt, you'll give your own shirt for them for the rest of your life because they were there in a time where you're in the, in the worst situation possible. And then you all got through it together. You all put your heads together. You all worked it. 
And uh, we were stronger than ever because of those failures that we, we had in 2018. We built, a, we built the business so much better um, and so much, with so much independence now with no single dependency. Um, it was all, that failure was all rooted in a single dependency. But uh, now we have a business that has multiple different, it's very independent, multiple different revenue streams. It's, it's much more untouchable. And you just learn so much from those situations, um, from your team, who's there, who's gonna, who's got your back, and how to come out and how to build a better business at the end of the day from that. And then there's also the one, the startups that you fail, and you, you learn pretty quickly with those ones. Um, thank you both. Um, so the next question would be, what is the best advice that you received from a mentor? And and probably also, is that the, the advice that you will give to someone starting the business uh, right now? So two questions combining one. Well, uh, I could make a list of advice I've gotten. Everything from you need to bring in this person as a, this company as a strategic partner to you need to raise more capital now to you should sell the business now rather than put more cap like. The, 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 the list is endless, endless Nikitsa. Um, the, the, the point is um, find good mentors, people with good judgment, people that are, who aren't doing it because they want to make money off of you. They're doing it because they're happy to share their experience because you seem like a, uh, a good, honest person who's, who's trying, to, um, trying to be successful in life. Yeah, I agree with John. There isn't a, it's not a singular thing that's uh, the best thing someone says. It's, uh, it's just an addition of so many different things and they all are equally valuable at different stages. Um, I wouldn't put one ahead of the other, um, but all everything that, that a mentor says is valuable equally. Um, thank you both. Uh, we have on this call Nina Nikolic. Nina is one of the founders of Startup Macedonia, uh, but her question question is not directly related to startups, but indirectly, yes. So the question is for John, because she's a great fan of uh, Raptors, essentially, and of Drake. So the question is uh, whether uh, linking the Drake with the Raptors brought some success to Raptors, and also whether you're willing or whether you're able to bring Drake sometime in Macedonia, <laughs> maybe for first time. <laughs> uh... Drake helped particularly with the American athletes bringing a comfort to, to living and playing in Toronto that um, was very helpful. Uh, I tried addressing that in the early years by bringing in Isaiah Thomas, who had been an NBA champion, African-American, to be the general manager. Uh, after I left, they had a falling out with Isaiah, and they kind of got off that. But, um, you know, we're, we're not Americans. Uh, there are differences, and um, and 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 Drake was uh, very helpful with the players, um, feeling comfortable uh, as the only team that's not in the USA um, uh, playing in Toronto. Uh, I would love to bring him over to uh, to uh, the Skopje Skopje Fest uh, 2021, um, but uh, you know. We'll see. He's a busy guy. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Well, really hoping to see him or some other great uh, athletes. Uh, I would also um, uh, pose a question which you partly, John, answered already. It, it is about investing in this time. So is it a good time to, to expand the business or should businesses, especially startups, wait a bit to, to see how the situation develops and then uh, invest? I'll let Chris go first, what he thinks. Yeah, I think this is the best time. Um, like, for example, the, the things that, we're, that I'm doing is really trying to take the current businesses that I have and make them as polished as possible during this time. But at the same time, you know, we're looking to, to acquire it, and hopefully we will very shortly. So the idea of starting something right now while you have a lot of time on your hands is absolutely the best time to do it. I, this is an opportunity like everyone has, has been alluding to. Um, in a lot of ways, this can be used as an opportunity to, to buy private assets, to you know, start something new um, if you have the time, and, uh, really, and really kind of you know, 
make your current assets as polished as possible. So I would say yes. Uh, it, for an investment point of view, this is when I would think about investing most, most, the the most in, in the last five to ten years. Like I think this is the opportunity to to invest and acquire. Totally, totally agree with Chris. Um, your best. Uh, you, sometimes you'll find your best opportunities are when everyone else is beaten up. You just have to be smart about how you deploy it and do your homework because um, it is going to be harder to raise capital for the next, you know, year, 18 months. Um, so you, you want to figure out where you're going to spend your bullets instead of spending them all early. But don't be afraid to invest in downtimes. Downtimes are the best. Sometimes I've found I've made some of my best deals in downtimes. Uh, thank you both. And uh, now probably I would ask you a question which is more related to the culture and cultural differences. I know Chris partly addressed this, but he went into uh, other area, did not discuss a lot the, the, the culture. Uh, so you are from Macedonian origin, but both of you are second and third generation living in Canada. But you still have, especially Chris has uh, uh, more connections now to, to Macedonian businesses, also Macedonian business, but also knows the business environment and I would say business culture in the country. So uh, if I ask you, like, how do you define business culture in Macedonia or how it differs from the one in Canada? And what would be your advice, like for, a, I don't know, policymaker probably to change? Like what can we, the culture is the most difficult thing to change, institution to change, but still what would be, what would you like us to, to change in our uh, business culture and work culture? Chris? Um, so in terms of like the business culture, I, I can, you know, when you look at America and then you look at Europe in general, I find Macedonia and Serbia are kind of the same thing. Um, it's just a, it, it's a European style culture uh, where as in America, it's a, it's a very hungry type of culture. Like uh, it's a very go, 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 go. Whereas in Europe, it's a uh, less less go 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 than it is here in America, um, and there's benefits to it depending on how you look at it. In, in a purely business perspective, you know sometimes you wish that Macedonia and Serbia had that go 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 mentality uh, that you see in America, um, and sometimes you don't. But the the, the business culture, the, the major difference that I see is that. Uh, it's, it's significantly more relaxed um, in Europe than it is in, in America. And I don't think there's a, well, I guess maybe in Asia, some places are quite go, go, go as well. But uh, between Europe and, and America, it, it's significantly more relaxed. And sometimes I wish it was uh, more, more of that hungry. I, I'm, I'm hungry for all the time. Like I, I love hustling. I love going out there. Um, I love working. I, I enjoy it. Uh, I, so, Sometimes I wish I see more of that. Um, I think the biggest thing we have to fix in North in Macedonia is is having the governments recognize that the bureaucracy, the court system, everything has to be independent. I I, I you know from the time I've been involved in Macedonia twenty twenty five. Um, so many decisions kind of seem to be impacted by how the current government of the day wants things done as opposed to uh, what's best for the business community. Um, and, and I don't know if it'll change, but I sure hope it does for the region because uh, people aren't afraid of governments in North America. They, they have a business idea, they go do it. Uh, it, it, it seems uh, in East Europe, it's much more, I better make sure this is gonna be okay with the government and people are you know, fine with what I'm doing. And that, that, that's a real hindrance. And it's something we have to change. And it, it permeates through the court system, through the customs and uh, tax systems, um, the pensions, everything. It's, uh, these things are not apparatuses of the government. The, 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 they need to be there to support the people stronger than they do. Thank you. Um, I hope we will change that. I, I remember Chris. That's was your so job. Frustrated. Yes, Chris was so frustrated years ago when he was starting uh, the business with with Cosmic. But I hope that there has been positive development since since then, 
in the country. Uh, Marta, I would now um, give the floor to you with uh, some additional questions. Uh, yeah, I would like to, to connect um, uh, to this, what uh, John just said about the country and the problem that we have all. And to quote him, basically, um, uh, he gave this in the interview uh, 2017 for Macedonia 2025. Uh, and John said, and yet at the end of the day, people have to trust you and you have to have a reputation of honesty. Uh, this is how my parents raised my family. Just to go back to your family, to your, to your father, to the reputation of your family, of your business, of your, uh, of your success as an entrepreneur, and how does it uh, reflect to the situation that we have now in the country? Well, even my Baba Zindero said to us from, uh, from uh, when we were young that uh, all you have when you die is your reputation. And, uh, and so it was always ingrained in us that, um, you know, people find out. If you're going to try and cheat someone or take advantage of a situation uh, unfairly, people will know. And you just have to be cognizant of that. And I, I, I think that... Uh, um, you know, I was blessed that my parents were mentors and always encouraging us to go pursue our dreams and our and our goals and our visions. And uh, I think it's one of the strengths of the Macedonian people is we continue to persevere um, despite the obstacles we've had for hundreds of years. And uh, uh, but nothing should get in the way because at the end of the day, we've got our families, we've got our culture, we've got our foods, we've got the things that that make us enjoy life. Um, business is just one aspect of it but um, people shouldn't be afraid to pursue it. And I think, I quite frankly, I do think at some point, the whole Balkan region is gonna become a huge growth opportunity. I do, I do believe, uh, you know, it is lagging behind Western Europe and, and, and people are, um, the one thing the, the internet and it has done is it's made everyone realize it doesn't matter where you are, what other people have, Instagram's probably the worst uh, culprit of that and it's going to force change it, it, it's inevitable it's going to force change mm. and for for the end i would like us to announce the next webinar, webinar i guess um, harry kramer and mike zafirovsky and ask you how do you spend your 168 hours i'm very different from harry uh <laughs> I, I, I do not allocate time for family or allocate or not want to watch TV because I only have so many hours. I do believe mentally you need things that relax you and put you in a comfort zone. Um, I'm somewhere in the middle, but, you know, I'm sure people have heard, but a lot of times people say, you know, Americans live for work and Europeans work for, to live. And I'm somewhere in the middle. And, uh, and uh, I do believe in life balance. I do believe in having fun. Um, and and it's, I don't think I want to live my life where every hour is regimented. Having said that, I think Harry's unbelievable. I respect him so much. He's uh, achieved so many things that are, uh, you know, uh, incredible for, you know, when you live on this earth that uh, I love listening to him and hearing him because I always find him inspiration. And Chris, you want yeah, to say something? I reiterate exactly what John said. I mean, I feel exactly the same way as John. I don't regiment anything specifically. Yep. Okay, so yeah, the, and this situation also changed our regiment quite a bit. Uh, but we'll, we, when we get back to normal sometimes, I guess we will continue with our lives. In, in, the, in the meantime, we have to, to live and take the most of the opportunity of, of the situation that we live now. So with this, if Nikita, you don't have anything else to add, uh, I would like to close the, the webinar. Um, I'm, I'm happy we are on time and really like in the chat uh, part, uh, everyone is saying that this was a great discussion. 
Uh, what I would uh, like to say is that I really hope that uh, our startup community, but also SMEs, will use the knowledge and experience of John Chris, our board members, but also other professional diaspora members. I really think there is a great opportunity to mentor and support domestic businesses uh, because as someone here wrote, like in the U.S., the politician works to support the businesses, whereas in Macedonia, the businesses works work to support politicians. So I think businesses in Macedonia really need uh, great mentorship and, and support to internationalize, to increase their competitiveness and to become successful uh, worldwide. And thank you really uh, to, to John, um, to, to Chris, and as I mentioned, whole board and all the others to, to support Macedonian businesses. I would also like to mention that on the call, we have a few members which are members of our ambassador club and many of them are from Canada and I'm happy that we have so high presence in Canada. And maybe I would suggest that you guys without uh, me, but next time I will join you, that you also organize some, some meeting. I think it will be great to, to share your knowledge ideas and uh, hopefully to, to advise new programs that, that we can implement. Hey, 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 hey. While I have you, I've got you know, a lot of people on the call, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but the, the, the best thing we as an organization do is the annual summit. What, what, what's your thinking lately in terms of timelines and planning for the summit when you'll be able to make a decision on uh, what we can or can't do? So I, I would say that we, we should wait a little bit more after the uh, elections, but also to see how, the, because we have again spike in the number of infected persons and so on, uh, so hope that by end uh, June or beginning of July, we'll have decision. Uh, the other option is that we have the summit spring 2021, but I think that there is high demand for the summit. So we should still think of all the pros and cons uh, for the summit. But please, like everyone that is on this call, I think it's a great opportunity for networking. Uh, so uh, Chris mentioned that networks are, are very important. And I really think that the summit offers best networking uh, possible and that many new partnerships are, are established uh, there. So yeah, everyone can join. Just to add, the, the summit is like, the way I met John as a mentor, like, was at a, an event very similar to what we have, like the summit. It's just a random happen chance spot, like, like the summit. So mm -hmm. that's a, it's a really good spot to meet people and network and uh, find mentors as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chris. I would just like to, to add that uh, while a uh, bit of family supports uh, the program, which is providing experts and uh, to, to Macedonian uh, companies, uh, Chris is a uh, younger board member who supports young entrepreneurs in the country. Uh, his aim is to support and to, to, uh, to offer support to, to young entrepreneurs, but usually these are high school students. Uh, every year we have competition, we give awards to the best ones, but uh, Chris would like to further elevate this program and once the situation with pandemic ends, we will probably go into that uh, new venture to support young people start their own businesses. Um, so I think we are completely on time. Uh, again, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we, will, uh, we are recording this video, it will be posted on uh, social media and our website. And please, if you have any questions, maybe some potential connections that you've seen on this webinar, please write to us. We'll be happy to answer, to connect uh, everyone. Thank you, John, Chris, and Marta, and thanks everyone else that is on this webinar. Thank thanks, you. Marta. Thanks, Nikita. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.